Hello, and welcome to the Zero to Hired podcast, the show that helps struggling job seekers find a career that's right for you. In every episode, we have one mission, to provide you with unique tips and strategies from leading industry experts that will get you in front of hiring managers. Enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Zero to Hired podcast. Our special guest today is Warda Abdul Samad. She immigrated to Canada as a teen with her family and learned English in the Canadian high school. She liked the ESL, which is the English uh, second language education so much that she wanted to work in the English language learners and help immigrants to Canada. She was lucky to do that for the last 15 years in various capacities. She's had roles that were ESL as an ESL teacher, a settlement worker, and an employment counselor specializing in working with immigrants. Please help me welcome Warda to the show. Hey, Warda. Thank you. Thank you for having me, John. This is, uh, we've got a pretty interesting topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is the idols, which is the preparation exam that, you know, foreigners or people outside of Canada have to write before they come into Canada, before they can even get their PR papers, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The IELTS test is used for immigration. It's used for academic institutions in English speaking countries. So it's a very popular test. This is excellent. So I, I, I know that we've actually had some people reach out to specifically to us asking us for help, which is why we've decided to reach out to you to, to be the expert on this area, because I believe, and from what I understand, you actually run exams and, and, and prepare people for exams for, for IELTS. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I'm an IELTS speaking examiner, and I used to teach IELTS preparation courses. So I'm pretty familiar with the um, the test. Excellent. Yeah. So before we actually get into the test and the preparation part, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and, and why this particular line of work is very interesting for you? Um, so like you said, I immigrated to Canada as a teen and um, essentially my parents immigrated. I was just kind of like, you know, a minor accompanying them. <laughs> yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, my parents struggles in terms of learning language and the immigration process, applying, uh, getting a job in Canada was, um, it kind of left an impact on me. Um, and then on top of that, when I came to Canada, my English, um, as a second language classes in high school were so great. And I loved my teachers. It just seemed like a natural thing for me to do. I don't think I really set out to do that, but everything I have done, kind of brought me to where I am right now. Yeah, like in terms of uh, my ba- yeah, my undergrad like my undergrad was in English. I did um TESOL Ontario, which is a certificate that allows me to teach ESL. And then I I got into the roles that I have right now, IELTS uh examiner and employment counselor. Nice. And and mm-hmm. there is a big need, right? So I and we see it and actually we get and we get emails almost daily on, you know, how do I prepare? What is Canadian experience like? How do I get through? Uh, the language barrier yeah. seems to be a big one, right? So, um, That's, yeah. yeah, so as they're going through this, so as they're going through the preparation, uh, what do you see right now and from the people that you've met who are in the process of writing their exam? What is their biggest challenge? Um, sifting through all the materials that are available is a challenge for candidates. Um, confidence is a challenge for candidates. Um, those are some of the major um, obstacles that candidates have. There are a lot of resources available online. Some of them are great, some of them not so great. Um, and then uh, it's expensive, or it could be expensive depending on, obviously on the candidate's financial abilities. So it's it's something that is needed for them to immigrate or for them to, to get into colleges or universities in Canada. So it's, it's an important test and it kind of takes a toll sometimes on candidates. Mm-hmm. So when I see them across from me as um, like in the, in the speaking test, mm-hmm. a lot of times all that pressure and all that anxiety is manifested mm-hmm. in the 11, 12 minutes that I have them. And it's not a very good time to be nervous. 
Yeah. So yeah. you ask, wow, you only get 11 to 12 minutes to determine your fate and how the rest of your life kind of works out for a little bit. So, wow. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Talk about pressure, right? Eh? Yeah. Um, so uh -huh. we talked about resources. You said there's a, a few resources online. So actually we'll go back to that later. Um, yeah. But going through materials. So how, how does someone kind of lay out the material so they can absorb it a little bit better? Um, so the test itself is divided into four things. Actually, let me go back for a okay. second. Mm -hmm. So the test is supposed to measure, um, in a standardized way, a candidate's language abilities at that moment. Okay. So, um, your, your language competency, that's what it's measuring. And it's measuring four different skills. It's measure, measuring the reading skills, the writing skills the speaking skills, and the listening skills. Those are the four. Um, so your question was, how can they prepare, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. How do they break it out? Or what would be a mm -hmm. successful process that they could follow to effectively prepare for each of those four areas? Yeah. Reading, writing, listening. What was the third one? Reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Oh, speaking and listening. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those four skills. So... For the, like, like I said, there are a lot of really great resources, and I would highly recommend candidates to rely on those resources, especially resources that are from um, the organizations that manage the test. Okay. Um, those organizations are the British Council, IELTS Australia, and Cambridge English Language Assessment. Okay. So if uh, candidates go on their those websites, the website of websites of those organizations. They have a lot of prep materials. So that's one way, but it can be overwhelming. So if it's an option, it's also a good idea to take a good IELTS preparation course. Okay. So that. Yeah. And what does that do? How that, does that kind of give them the advantage? That prepares the candidate for the test in the sense that it takes that, um, that sense of um, overwhelm away mm -hmm. from the candidate. It breaks it down, so they'll focus on, okay, what do you need for the, the, the reading skills or how essentially understanding the structure of the test is very important. Mm. And these courses allow that. That's what they provide. Another thing that candidates really need to understand is uh, looking at the band descriptors. So the IELTS test is um, divided into nine bands. Okay. Nine is somebody who's very proficient in the language, and zero is somebody who, or one is somebody who um, can barely speak the language, like can barely make a sentence. Okay. That's what it, I've never seen a one, I've never seen a two, I think I've, the lowest I've seen was a four. So, okay. and that's very okay. rare to see lower than that. Why would you waste money if you feel like, you know, you can't produce the language? But, um, so understanding how the bands work and it's divided into each skill. So there's a band descriptors for the speaking, there are band descriptors for the writing, the reading, and so on. Okay. So understanding and looking and um, kind of breaking that down really helps candidates. Okay. So this is good. So there's nine bands, and so and you're saying the lowest that you've ever seen. So in order to be successful is a four. Mm -hmm. So to, to be successful as a, as a mm, candidate, what do no, you... No, no, no. Let me go back. Sorry. Okay. The lowest go. I've seen is a four simply because that's where the, the language competency of that candidate was. Oh, okay. So there is no pass or fail. In there is no pass. Okay. There is no pass or fail. Yeah. It's just where are you in your language right now? Where are you in English? That's, okay. all, that's all it measures. Now... Oh, okay. Take that, where are you in English, to where are you trying to apply the test? So, for example, if you were trying to immigrate to Canada, just immigration by itself, mm -hmm. don't quote me on this, Canada needs to double check, but I believe Canada is looking for either level four or level five minimum oh, for immigration. Okay. Now, if is I was applying to a... Yeah, so hold on a second. Sorry, Let me just ask ahead. a quick question. The so does that mm -hmm. matter on the type of career that you're going into? It will. Okay. So, but in the set, like, 
So you immigrate to Canada, you have, say, for example, a uh, uh, band four, mm-hmm. the, the, the score that you were given, you have a score four, okay. um, and then you came to Canada. Now, what's the next step for you to find a job? Well, you can find a job at um, an, or an organization or an institution that doesn't really work in English, and you're okay. There are a lot of you know, workplaces that don't use English. And that's fine. Yeah. But if you're trying to work in a workplace that speaks uh, English, I don't know workplaces that ask for, uh, for IELTS, but they might, especially if it's professional, um, professional places like um, engineering or medicine mm-hmm. trying to uh, register with those associations. They do ask for IELTS. So that's where you will need the higher score, not for immigration, but registration with certain professional associations. Yeah, and I and I guess it becomes very obvious. And uh, when mm-hmm. you go out and you do your interviews, and in most cases they do a phone interview first. And if you're English, is mm-hmm. it? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not, I'm gonna use the word clean. Like if it's not comprehensive, you can't communicate effectively. Yeah. People don't understand what you're saying. It's gonna reduce your chances. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I didn't. So there is no pass or fail, which is good, uh, but it would mm-hmm. it will dictate where you'll be able to go to next, depending on your level. Not that any. I don't. Exactly. I've ever seen an organization ask for. Um, yeah. An exam, right? Sorry. So you were you were no. you were making another point after that. So you're, you're talking four to fives, and we talk about career and career options and organizations. Mm-hmm. There's something else that you were trying to add on. Yeah, so immigration is around four or five. Okay. But then college is so now if a candidate wants to go to college, mm. well, they need a different set. So say they immigrated to Canada and their level was five. They took they took ESL classes, um, improved their English, and now they're trying to get into college. Well, now their requirement is different. Depending on the college, I believe they usually ask around seven, six and a half, something like that. Oh, wow. Okay. So now that's what they will need to get into college. And then if you're trying to go to a university, it might be a little bit higher, something like seven seven 7.5. Or if it's a postgraduate, like a master's, they might be asking for eight. So it depends on what you're trying to do with the IELTS. There is no pass or fail. It just depends on what you're trying to do with the IELTS. Okay. Because it measures where you are in your language. Okay. So, so, uh-huh. so outside of actually doing a preparation course and going through the resources that you listed, so the you know Cambridge British, uh, I'll, I'll include the the links in the uh, in the show notes yeah. afterwards, so people can see it yeah. for themselves and they can go off and click on it. What else can they do? Uh-huh. So, say they don't have the so you know, and I'm thinking as an audience member that's across overseas somewhere, and I don't have money to take a course. Uh, what else yeah. can they do? So how can I effectively prepare for the exam without actually taking a course? Like what are what are some other options? Surprisingly, YouTube has a lot of oh, wow. um, IELTS content that okay. is pretty good from IELTS teachers, people who run their own courses. Okay. Um, so I would recommend candidates to check that out. So look at that. Um, and then there are also a lot of teachers who have their websites and materials up. Um, doing There are a lot of mock tests that are available. Um, so I would also recommend definitely, regardless of whether you have the resources to do a course or not, mm-hmm. to do the mock test by yourself. There's a, a lot of resources in the sense of just like, and when I say the mock test, like that would be like reading, the writing, and the listening. Mm-hmm. But then the speaking, the speaking is one-on-one with a live person, right? So you yeah. can't really do that, but you can look online and there are sample uh, speaking tests. And um, obviously the questions are different, but the format is the same. Oh, okay. So is there, yeah. and, and I think about this from a public speaking perspective, right? Even, so yeah. even when you do random conversations, really nothing's random because you can effectively prepare for something before it becomes, you know, before it shows up. Uh-huh. And it's random, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah. so how so, can they prepare? So how can, so since the format is, is pretty f- standard across the board, 
what can yeah. they do? Like, what can they prepare with? So they come in and, and they, like, essentially, we want them to get the highest possible score because it kind of opens up a lot more doors, right? When it comes to opportunities here in North America yeah. for work, right? So what mm-hmm. are your suggestions for that? So what I used to do when I was teaching IELTS and what I noticed now that I'm an IELTS examiner is that preparing for the topics is secondary. And I see that um, I see a lot of clients, a lot of candidates who come in and they have memorized a certain topic or a whole bunch of topics Mm -hmm. and they want to come in and they want to essentially recite or they want to be automatic with their responses. Well, as an IELTS examiner, I'm not supposed to really accept that. If I notice a candidate is giving me rehearsed responses, I have a lot of uh, samples of questions that I can, like, I would vary the questions. So yeah. it's like, okay, well, you know this topic. You heard, you know, somebody told you this was on the test. Hmm. And I will move on and I will choose a different topic because I'm supposed to get natural language. I'm supposed to elicit natural language from the candidate, right? Mm-hmm. So memorizing answers is not really the way to go. Specifically for the speaking test, understanding the structure is what's important. So the speaking test, there are three parts to it. The first part is the introduction. Um, essentially, it works just to break the ice. Okay. to get the candidate comfortable. Um, so the, the test will ask very, not very personal, but a personal question, like um, uh, the city they live in or um, specific things that they like, mm-hmm. their yeah. opinions on specific things. So it's all from a personal perspective. And these are and just... Candidates feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. And these are just natural, like standard things, right? So, you know, mm-hmm. when you said, where do you live? What's your favorite uh, yeah. dessert or uh, exactly? So it's just yeah. Okay, so that's good. So yeah. Introduction. Uh-huh. Ice, we call it. I call it an icebreaker. Just this is who I exactly, am. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And the second yeah. part. The second part is connected to the third part in the sense of the topic, mm-hmm. but the second part is where um, essentially you're kind of giving um, a speech for two minutes or okay. one to two minutes. So um, the, the examiner will give you a topic. You will have one minute to prepare, take make notes or whatever, and then you will start speaking. And you will speak for two minutes. So in the first part, um, I'm, when the candidates are speaking and they're answering the questions, for me, I have an idea of the neighborhood that they're in, like or like where they sort of are. So. I'll be like in my head, okay, this candidate is band six or seven. Or this candidate is seven or eight. And then by the second uh, part where you're doing a speech um, or you're speaking for two minutes, not really a speech, but like you're speaking for two minutes, I have a better idea of where you are. I'm getting closer. So I'll be like, okay, this is like around seven. Hmm. Let me see how much... um, like how closer they are to seven or maybe eight or maybe six, that sort of thing. And this is where um, you'll see either a candidate who has rehearsed or you'll see like uh, the, the fluency or like um, the inability to, to stretch the language. Um, that's where like the yeah. language problems will crop up. That that's where they will appear. Um, so that's the second part. And then the third part is a conversation between the examiner and the candidate. So the topic will be related. So for example, if we were, if I asked you your favorite clothing in part two, um, part three will be like about clothing in general. Okay. And part three is divided to three sections. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so three, <laughs> I know. three sections. All right. Within so, part three. Yeah. So, yeah. and all of this is like behind the curtain kind of information. Yeah. That you wouldn't really know unless you have taken or you have read a lot about IELTS, mm-hmm. right? Unless you have taken a course or you've read a lot about IELTS. So in, in the third part, there are three sets of questions and I'm not going to ask you all three. I'm just going to ask you two, depending on what band you are, what band you are. So part one, again, is an introduction to the topic. 
So, so we're talking about clothing in general. I'll ask you more, um, like I'll ask you questions about clothing or clothing in your country or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then the second section in part three is for candidates who are lower than seven because it's easier than part three. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now if a candidate, yeah, so now by, by this time, I have a very good idea of where the candidate is. So if I feel this candidate is seven and below, I'm going to ask section one and section two. But if the candidate is eight and above, which means eight or nine, then I'm going to be asking one or three. And three is where you get very theoretical. Um, it's supposed to be more uh, towards academically geared candidates. Okay. So it's more complex. Wow. Okay. I'm not going to ask uh-huh. you the specifics on the type of question, but... Uh, yeah, like, it, yeah. It, it, so there would be some thinking as you're speaking type of... Uh, so it's not, just, it's not yeah. just an automatic response, right? And at no, that point... And it's not supposed to be. Yeah. yeah, it's not supposed to be automatic. So that's the thing. Um, so how can candidates prepare best? Mm-hmm. Understanding the structures. That's how they can prepare best. Memorizing, and I do see a lot of times when I'm like coming in or if I'm, you know, taking a break during the examination, candidates who are sitting in the hallway and literally they are memorizing responses. So like, that's just going to make you more nervous because how many paragraphs can you hold in your head? Not that many. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So the one thing for me that keeps coming up or, you know, what I keep thinking about is practice, right? And just having these conversations, yeah. speaking those sample. Yeah. So I'm a big Toastmaster and, you know, I, it's an organization mm-hmm. that actually helps you with your public speaking. And I've been a member yeah. of, you know, Toastmaster clubs for the last, oh, it's been almost 12 years. And a lot of new Canadians yeah. join so they can practice their English, right? Yeah. And I've seen how it's... 100%. You know, and, mm-hmm. and, and it's just a matter of that practice. And one of the things they do inside of Toastmasters is they do something called table topics, which is essentially impromptu speaking. You're given a topic and then you have to speak on it for a minute or two, which is exactly what you yeah. guys are doing in your exam. So that could be yeah. another resource for them to to try out, make sure, you know, wherever country they're located, as long as they join an English Toastmasters club to get yeah. that proficient, to, to, in order to get proficient in the English language, to just practice it over mm-hmm. and over and over, right? And that's, mm-hmm. you know, that's a pretty low cost uh, solution to it as well. Or even taking the questions and kind of speaking to your English friends about it and kind of getting Exactly, yeah. Yeah, no, preparation yeah. is one of the and things we're, we're big on. Sorry, go ahead. Another thing that I really need to, uh, candidates to know is I talked about the band descriptors. So the bands are nine mm-hmm. bands. And then within the nine bands, you got four things that are measuring in the speaking. I can't speak for the other tests. They have the same or they have like, you know, they have their own things that they're measuring. But in the speaking... What's being measured is, and this information is public. Okay, okay. Um, yes. <laughs> there's the fluency. <laughs> we don't want to get there's, you in trouble. Measu- no, we don't. <laughs> so we're measuring fluency. Okay. We're measuring a candidate's ability, their lexical resource. So that means like the amount of vocabulary that they have. Um, the third thing we're measuring is grammar and how accurate your grammar is. And the fourth thing is pronunciation. So the British Council, IELTS Australia, and Cambridge English Language Assessment, they have public versions of the, 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 um, the rubric, essentially, that we are using. Okay. And they are pretty accurate and pretty close to what we're actually using. So, for example, what's important is that <laughs> native speakers usually um, score about 7.5 especially when they have unprepared, not because they can't speak the language, but because they don't know what we're looking for, right? Yeah. So often what I find, the candidates that I know, like, from the bottom of my heart, that they can't speak English, mm-hmm. and I'll still give them, you know, not an eight, not a nine, because there are certain things that they don't know. So, for example, if, you're, if you feel like your language is pretty good, um, and you're between seven and eight, the distinguishing aspect is how coherent and developed your 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 topics are. So mm. if I had asked you about clothing 
and you just gave me very surface response or you didn't really get into it, then I can't really give you that eight. Okay. And in a nine, you're definitely um, getting into it and deconstructing the topic. And it's, to be honest, like it's very pleasurable to, to talk to somebody who's nine because it's, it, it becomes like a very um, deep conversation. Yeah. So you're, you're now For talking. Me as a yeah. And if, if you're talking mm-hmm. about clothing, it could be, and this is just an example, you're talking about texture, you're talking about color, you're talking about materials. Uh, yeah. You know, you're, you're going into all the little details that you know, essentially mm-hmm. you start to visualize as you're having the conversation. Right. And it's, it's exactly, I, I could see the difference. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah. service level. Yeah. But that's kind of interesting mm-hmm. that native speakers are typically a 7.5, right? It's, uh, I would have never thought, yeah. you know, like you're born, you're raised yeah. here and you're still not a nine. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, follow you out there, you know, to get a nine is, is a pretty difficult thing to do. I'm sure there's a couple of native speakers that hit nines, but it's not a general mm-hmm. across the board type yeah. of scoring. Wow. Okay. Nine is usually somebody who is in academia and not necessarily, I'm not saying like a PhD holder or anything like that. Is just um, their vocabulary is very well developed. Their topic um, is very well developed. Pronunciation is so we're not me- we're not checking. Oh, does this person have an accent in terms of pronunciation? Because I know a lot of candidates worry about their pronunciation. We're not checking for accent. We're just checking does your accent get in the way of you being um, uh, understood? That's mm. all we're checking. Yeah, and that's how the different bands measure that. So somebody who's number nine, their accent has no effect. And then in uh, number eight, their accent has minimal effect on them being understood. Yeah. So even, right? yeah, so yeah. And yeah. I'm thinking, and I'm thinking as an audience member, I'm listening. I'm like, okay, so, so there's hope for me. I have a little bit of an accent or <laughs> I, I have yeah. an accent, but I can still speak very coherently because I know that's one of the things mm-hmm. that people worry about, right? Is, you know, how do I get past yeah having this accent that could deter, you know, but it, in your exams and the IDL exams, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And the, to tell yeah. you the truth, if you can do that in the IDLs exam, then when you actually do interviews with hiring managers, yeah. or recruiters, that comprehension yeah. is still going to come through regardless of your, of your accent. So, mm-hmm. You know what today, exactly. it's a standard thing to find accents in a lot of organizations because there's like Canada is yeah. a multicultural country, right? So it's absolutely, you know, yeah. Whether you're from, uh, I know, and this is something that, yeah, this is something that I see as an employment counselor, and I'm sure you see like accent. People worry about that so much, but yet Toronto, for example, all over the GTA, over fifty percent are not born in the GTA, yeah, or like are not born in Canada. So the accent is everywhere, yes. and IELTS is aware of that. They're not penalizing people for having an accent. It's just does your accent get in the way of you being understood? Yeah. No, and uh, so so GTA, I'm just going to clarify for everybody. GTA is the Toronto Sorry, greater. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we do have audience yeah. members around the world. So it's the greater Toronto area. So it's it's mm-hmm. a, a mix of five different cities that came the mega city called Toronto. Um, yeah. 50%. Wow. So I didn't realize like that number, it was that high. 50% are not mm-hmm. Canadians, right? So. Yeah, yeah I think Markham is sixty percent. Sixty percent, and that's you know that's the Asian community, yeah. and every pocket of the city has different uh, communities. Yeah. But yeah, no, and if you're downtown, you get a mix of people from South America, people from Southeast Asia, you get people from uh, even Australia, yeah. and I'm sure you know my you know the way I speak sounds like an accent to some people, so it's it's pretty mm-hmm. interesting that that even wow okay. So that's good. So it's it's good yeah. news for, for people that are going through it and they're worried about, you know, my accent. Is it going to prevent me from, A, getting through the exam? And if it does, then, you know, so it's yeah. that right there. I should be a little bit of a stress reliever for some people, right? Which is really Absolutely. Cool. So another thing that ASL teachers do um, that improves candidates' um, language levels, not mm-hmm. just with IELTS, but just in general, is their ability to handle um, idiomatic language. So what I mean by that is like idioms, okay. like Idiom. things like, I don't know, yeah, give me a hand or, um, <laughs> yeah. Andrew, like I can't, <laughs> you know, like I can't think of uh, other idioms right now, but um, their ability to use idioms. 
Okay. So when I say lexical resources, which is the second thing that we're measuring in the speaking test, I'm checking um, how varied your vocabulary is, how complex your vocabulary, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, are you using idioms? Are you using them appropriately? Um, and like, are you using more than like? And sometimes, like, because candidates have taken a course or they work for the tutor, and they're kind of given two or three idioms, and they're just repeating those same idioms all over. Yeah. So it's like, okay, great, you have some, but you don't have a varied amount. Yes. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm I'm just trying to think of an idiom is you know like that's sick, right? But it doesn't mean like someone's yeah. sick. It just means like it, yeah, it could yeah. be it could be a few different things, right? Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. the English language is kind of confusing that way, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. I'm glad I don't have to learn English because it's. I think I would. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I learned it as a kid, so I'm lucky too. Yeah, and yeah. you grow up with these uh, idioms, and you know they, yeah. they become part of your natural language, and it's just so. How would somebody? And yeah. actually, I'm going to start wrapping it up because we're we're getting near that time. So, how would yeah. how would somebody learn the proper Canadian? Well, we're talking Canadian because that's where we're located. How would they l brush their skills up on on Canadian idioms? Oh, um. So there are courses that they can take online. Really? Some of them okay. free. Um, what's it called? Um, uh, like a lot of ESL teachers put their content online in blogs and websites, okay. and um, it's great. So here's the thing with the IELTS is not necessarily checking Canadian English. As a matter of fact, I think oof, I, I think sixty percent of the content in the IELTS English is British and Australian English. Okay. And um, even more than that, um, and the rest is uh, North American English. Okay. Um, okay. So um, they're not looking for we're not looking for Canadian idioms. We're just looking for English. Okay. All across, and that's fine. Um, in terms of um, improving people's um, idiomatic language, when I was a teacher, I used to love um, showing uh, my students. Stand up comedy. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so that's a really good place to learn um, idiomatic language. Okay. And it's, it's lots of fun too. You get to laugh. Yeah. So, comedy, uh, sitcoms, those kind of places. But then okay. also, there are a lot of materials that, like, and the materials that you'll find online is like this idiom, this is what it means, and this is how you use it. But then once you're watching uh, stand-up comedy or watching a sitcom, a TV show, you're getting it in life, in context. Okay. So it's a good combination to do. So stand-up and comedy and sitcoms. Yeah, I think of, yeah. so, you know, the Southeast Asian community, very big, Russell Peters. Um, that's yeah. what I think about in, in terms of comedy. And he, he's got a, he, he does a really good job with the language. So, yeah, no, definitely. He does, he does. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've great. showed him to my to my students, yeah, and yeah. friends, friends that show friends. Wow, well, okay, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty clean. You can show it in a classroom, and uh, it's fun, okay. and it has a lot of varied language. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. So, so where does so. Uh, so we're, we're, we're getting to the end of our podcast here. Uh, if people wanted to learn more about you and, you know, the type of things that you do, and if they wanted to, you know, possibly even get into contact with you, where could they go? Like, where can they get more information? So right now I'm in the middle of creating my website. Okay. Uh, by the time you publish this, um, I'll give it to you and you can include it with the, um, the, 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 the podcast. Yeah. With the show notes. Um, yeah, and um, LinkedIn is a really good place to get a hold of me. Okay. Um, yeah, those are the two places. <laughs> okay, so great. So I'll make sure um, I'll include those. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there was something else you wanted to yeah. add? I actually want to just give last-minute advice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to say to candidates, to, to people, don't be nervous. Okay. Like, that's one of the things that really messes people up. Um, they're nervous. They're all the hopes and dreams and anxiety and fears come to play when they sit across from the, uh, the speaking examiner. And I've seen people who would have probably gotten like maybe a seven, seven and a half, but because somehow in the middle 
they got a question that scared them. And all of a sudden now they're not producing language anymore. And that drops from two points or a point or something like that. So please don't be nervous. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and really yeah. the best way to be not nervous is just to be prepared. And that, and that goes yeah, for and interviews as well, right? So. Absolutely. And remember, IELTS examiners are people just like you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, there's nothing <laughs> special about us aside from like, you know, being people. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that human, the human aspect sometimes gets forgotten because it's so, this is the exam. Yeah. And depending on the culture you come from too, right? Like they, they look at different, mm -hmm. different titles differently. So yeah, just yeah. you know, here and this is what I love about North America. I find there isn't that much of a divide between, uh, like, really, no. we're, we're we're just people. Yeah, we're, we're not a hierarchical culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's really yeah. important to remember. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, the test is very the test is scripted. So like I, I especially uh, part three is the only time that I can ask questions that are related to the topic. But mm -hmm. part two and part three, I have to stick to a script. Okay. So the interaction, it, it can be pretty robotic. And candidates, if they're not prepared or if they don't have that information, the, the examiner might seem like a very mean and unfeeling person, but we're not, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> it's just that we have a test that is scripted and we're not supposed to deviate from that script. Yeah. So just remember that, like, and sometimes uh, candidates will, you know, try to have a conversation and it's just like, and I have to be like, no, thank you, kind of in a polite way, mm -hmm. um, as, as, as quickly as I can. Not because I don't want to talk, but because I can't. Yeah. So, and that, just, like, that puts people off. Yeah. And, and, and that's just, just to ensure consistency across the board, right? It's the same reason exactly, why people, yeah. people in interviews ask the same questions because they want to make sure that everybody mm -hmm. has the same uh, advantage, yeah. right, essentially. So if yeah. you, you're asking two different candidates yeah. two different questions, you don't really get mm -hmm. a full measure. So, yeah, it, and it's just a consistency yeah. thing. And it's just to be fair. And then, you know, yeah. that's how you answer the question that really determines the outcome. Or in, in the case exactly. of the IELTS, is what your levels are. So yeah, no, so yeah. thank you, thank you for. I don't. Is there any other tips that you want to provide? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Okay, great. Yeah. Don't so, prepare. Don't be nervous. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Be prepared. Don't be nervous. See, it's not very difficult. Mm -hmm. Just don't be nervous. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's done yeah. through. And, and you touched on a lot of different things that you know our candidates can do to really effectively prepare for the idols exam, so they can be successful. So this is great. So yeah. thank you for your time mm -hmm. today. Thank you for being on the Zero to Hired podcast. I know. This is probably going to be one of the most listened to podcasts, if I can put a prediction, <laughs> here, only because of the topic. And like I said, yeah. it's something that we get quite a bit of in terms of questions on how to effectively prepare mm -hmm. and pass for the exam. So this is great. Yeah. And yeah, so thank you for, for joining us today and thank you for sharing your insights. And I'll make sure that I include your links so people can connect uh -huh. with Florida. This has been fantastic. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So for everybody else out there that's listening in the zero to the zero to hired world, thank you for listening and tuning into the show. Uh, I know there's going to be some really good resources here for you, so make sure you go through it if you need to go through it more than once because there's it's so rich in in terms of content. Uh, so that is it for the show, and thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Thank you for listening to the Zero to Hired podcast. Make sure you check out our website, www.zerotohired.com and download your free resume template that's proven to get results, complete with examples and guidelines. Make sure you tune in as we interview leading industry experts who provide tips and strategies to help you get the career that's right for you.